Welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. Today, I'm speaking with High Performance Manager at the Seattle Sounders, Dave Tenney. Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to episode 29 of the Pacey Performance Podcast. Just before we get going with today's guest, I just want to say thank you very much for all the feedback I've been getting. And we've reached 20,000 downloads, well over 20,000 downloads now. So I really appreciate the support people are giving me uh, on social media and drop me emails and, and whatnot. So today we've got Dave Tenney on the phone. So as I said in the introduction, Dave is the high performance manager at Seattle Sounders. Dave put some really great information out in his, uh, through his conferences. So he runs two a year, as he mentioned in the episode, one of which is in the middle of June this year, which I am hoping to get out to Seattle to see. So if there's any guys in the UK who are also traveling out, drop me an email and uh, I'm sure we can hook up when we're there. So in this episode, we discuss culture in football, or soccer as Dave calls it, uh, from a staff and player's point of view. We discuss fatigue management protocols, GPS metrics, and his very impressive injury reduction record. A couple of these questions came from guys on Twitter, so really appreciate uh, people getting back to me when I've asked for questions and discussion points, what people want to hear. Just before we get onto the episode with Dave, just want to say that you can keep up to everything that's going on the podcast if you go to paceyperformance.co.uk and there'll hopefully be a, a new website coming the next couple of weeks which will make it more user friendly so people can listen a little bit easier you can also subscribe on iTunes and YouTube if you do listen via iTunes please can I ask that you give us give me a rating and a review for the podcast that would really help things uh, and move things along and here is the episode with Dave Tenney Okay, hi guys. Welcome to the Pace Performance Podcast. I've got a third person from Seattle on the phone today. We've gone from Chris Toombs uh, over to Dean Riddle, and now we've got Dave Tenney from the Seattle Sounders on the phone. So I'd just like to introduce Dave and just get him to give us a little bit of background and a bio on himself. So welcome to the podcast, Dave. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. And you got at least one American now you've got on there. Exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, no, I mean, seriously, thanks for having me. I mean, I think you do a great job with the podcast and uh, some high quality content and really some high quality uh, um, presenters and speakers at this point. So, cool. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Do you want to give us a little bit of background on yourself and uh, education and how you've got yeah, to where you are yeah. today? Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll kind of start where I am and kind of work backwards a little bit. I and mean, I'm just starting my uh, seventh year with the Seattle Sounders and MLS. Um, I was with Kansas City two years prior to that. Uh, my role here has kind of evolved over the last seven years from a from a head fitness coach to a performance manager type position um, with a staff of five people now kind of working under me um, in our department. Um, <clears throat> prior, you know, prior to Seattle, I was in Kansas City, and then prior to that, I was in George Mason University, working with the men's and women's programs there. Um, Looking back, I mean, I was actually a, a soccer player myself. Um, tried to went to Virginia Tech um, collegiately, played there. Uh, left there early to try to pursue a college career or a professional career in Germany, and bounced around the lower leagues there, and came back after two years, and then played a series of six years of indoor professional soccer under various franchises and leagues, and you know was was. Uh, professional I guess might be a stretch at times to say the level that that was um, <laughs> but uh, you know went back to school after I finished and and kind of thought I was just going to go the normal route of just being you know an academy coach or a director of coaching or something like that um, and I was really fortunate in 2004 as I'm finishing up then my bachelor's I'd gone back to George Mason then um, done a degree in was called coaching science at George Mason and then went to a uh, uh, the Czech Republic actually, and did the the Czech version of the UEFA license at uh, Charles University in Prague, 
and uh, and the level of kind of physiology and periodization and uh, training models, looking at different energy systems, was uh, was something that was was a a major part of that of that program, and it just kind of really clicked. Um, I ended up making that part of my my thesis for my bachelor's. Um, you know, and that was kind of the time when you had you know the Mourinho's and the the Wengers and those guys are really talking about this kind of integrated training model. Um, uh, finished that, and then went into the the masters in the uh, you know exercise science at George Mason, um, and then actually got a you know call an opportunity from Kansas City to go to MLS with Kansas City before I'd finished my masters. Um, so then I actually finished my masters online at California University um, soon after I was at was at uh, Kansas City. So. Um, yeah, and I just kind of progressed there. And as I said, I went from, you know, kind of like a lot of us, kind of the one-man show, doing everything at Kansas City in the first couple of years at uh, Seattle to to this kind of, you know, high-performance model that we're, we're trying to to evolve into now in Seattle. Mm. That's cool. So do you think your your badges and your kind of coaching experience has helped you in your, in your role going forward? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, because, yeah. you know, everywhere that I've been, I've kind of been seen as much of a – you know, say football coach as much of a football coach as a as a strength conditioning specialist well, okay. as well. So so it's helped in terms of um, you know again we talk about that integrated model of 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 looking at the loading of everything as what's happening on the field versus what's happening in the weight room and being able to have a say and really um, drive all of that together. I think is you know is obviously the best way when we're looking at driving performance and uh, and managing fatigue. So. Uh, yeah, and then I think all you know. Then the flip side is the buy-in from the players, and you know the understanding of the uh, of of where players are at and what they think and where they feel at the end of a let's say of, you know of a preseason training or you know what they feel after um, travel or you know and different areas like that. That I think having the experience, um, having been there a little bit, um, is a huge advantage. No, I think I think that's a massive um, massive advantage having played as well. Yeah. Uh, and obviously coaching I think that's a, a massive benefit like you say coming from the players point of view to to see they actually know what's going on you know it's not just stuck in the in the weights room or, or yeah. doing some yeah. you know doing the conditioning outside so that's yeah. cool and, and how that and how that actually works on our field is basically then it allows me to kind of transition the first part of training daily um, yeah. <clears throat> in terms of what our speed agility you know work might be um, what the warm up exercises may be and then and then the first exercise with the ball um, is typically then fallen under my my domain before then we go on to any tactical type exercises after that mm-hmm. no that's cool sounds great just uh, just like one thing on the on the high performance manager yeah. kind of uh, status how was that how has that evolved uh, from like an SNC coach or football coach into that high performance manager, and what what kind of um, what what does the role kind of represent? Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know, it, it, it's kind of evolved along with this kind of increase in, in in the sports science side as well. So, you know, I started Seattle, and you know, we're using a you know, polar team system type technology, like a lot of other people, and. Um, Around the second year, we started using you know some HRV type technology and utilizing Omega Wave, and then and then you know three years on, starting to utilize GPS, and and, and we're obviously creating more data streams from that side. Um, and then I I had started in increasing our, our utilization of, of you know interns, and I had then two two interns as well. Um, um, and we ended up hiring Ravi Ramanani, who's a uh, um, He's actually speaking at the MIT Sloan Sport Conference this week in the, the football analytics panel. Um, you know, and got him from Microsoft. And, and, you know, so basically, I had three people working underneath me in terms of of dealing with data, helping me in the weight room, helping me on the field, and and, and I was beginning to have a staff, but but not really. You know, so so basically, around that kind of coincided with the time where I went to. Uh, Australia in the postseason. I try to take a postseason trip every year. Um, so I went to Australia and saw, you know, kind of obviously what they're doing there. I mean, I got to know Darren Burgess when he was at Liverpool. So I spent some time at Port Adelaide with Darren um, and saw their high performance team there, which is, you know, to me, one of the prototypical high performance teams uh, that I've seen in sport, you know, in the world. Um, and, and it just made sense, I think, in terms of 
someone that's managing this flow of data, someone that's managing, you know, the what's going on in the weight room. Uh, and I think deriving the information to the uh, to the coaches, you know, because I think the high performance manager, it's about deriving everything you're doing from your side to ensure the coaches make are making really good decisions um, in terms of the information. So, so player status and 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 uh, what the training loads were, what guys are doing in the weight room, and and if you're you're in charge of deriving all that information, it, it can be a it can be a you know in a large a larger intricate process and in how you drive that information, um, and that's going to take away from your ability to be everywhere else and then you have to rely on really good snc and really good sports science guys who are dealing you know kind of at the ground level with the athletes at times mm. no, that's great just to uh just move it on a little bit i know you've got so much experience obviously um with darren burgess and afl and all them kind of things and obviously spending time with different football clubs the culture in football or in soccer how how have you kind of um managed that culture and try to create your own culture at Seattle and the other places that you've been. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think. Yeah, we were talking before. I mean, it's obviously a very. It's a big question, I think, because I think every every soccer culture brings its own unique culture and approach to to a lot of the the areas around fitness and S and C and all that. Um, yeah, I, sometimes I I feel like personally that there's a lot of S and C people that that are really critical of you know make a blanket statement about football culture and okay if soccer players don't like to lift weights and soccer players don't like to be in the gym and 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 we certainly know there are cultures that that can be like that I think um, but I think it's unfair to make a blanket statement across US soccer players versus English soccer players versus German soccer players versus Latin American soccer players. And I think um, the the average soccer player likes to do, a, you know, a, a lot with the ball. They don't like to be in the weight room as much as other sports, but but that doesn't mean that they won't, you know. So I think that, that it's about um, – setting you know setting expectations you know creating your own culture within your club um getting buy-in from from the top level of, of your of your playing staff um that what you do is important um and and we found that you know kind of guys guys do do it you know and eventually the goal is to get them to see the benefits of it um in terms of you know weight sessions but i think i think it's also then the approach from your your coaching staff as well as you know what's the expectations of your coaching staff and, and what's their um, approach towards strength training and fitness and, and utilizing, you know, kind of your, your performance team. Um, so, you know, I, it's funny where I think I've spent a lot of time with Darcy Norman, who's a, who's a really good friend of mine and, and we've traded stories about the soccer culture and, and obviously Darcy's gone in, you know, with athletes performance and exos into the German culture and dealt with the German players and was at Bayern Munich and, and, uh, We've had discussions about this, and he's uh, one of the things he always said when he was a Bayern is he's getting some of the big, you know, the big players of Bayern. I want you to come in after, you know, in the gym after and do some work with me. And you know, they're well, I don't know. And <laughs> you know, and Darcy's approach was like, hey, can you give me eight minutes? Because we can do something if you give me eight minutes. Okay, you know what? I'll, I'll give you eight minutes. <laughs> and, and I think it's, I think sometimes there's a disconnect between the S and C culture and, and the you know, the soccer football culture in terms of how much is enough. Uh, and, and I think the SNC person has an idea of how much is enough. But but I think I think that we can do more with less. You know, I think then that's what we've tried to do. I think in Seattle, we've tried to really look at, um, okay, if, if we do one really, really good strength session in the week, is that enough? Um, and, and we've really played around with some of the some of the models we, we've tried to, to utilize here, myself and my head SNC, Chad Kalarsik, um, and, and we did find, and we've had a, you know, obviously a big, bigger reduction in injuries over the past um, year. And, and part of it is that, okay, well, across the board, everyone is going to lift, but it's going to be one main session a week, um, and everyone is going to do, you know, 
hex bar deadlifts and some plyo progressions and you know weight vest pull-ups and some things like that um and then we'll do maybe a couple of really small maintenance type sessions um but that one main session a week well that's enough and and it and it's showing in terms of our injury reduction and, and we find that okay well typically tuesday afternoon is our strength training session okay the guys are going to come back tuesday afternoon and we're going to we're going to lift um and and it's effective and so from from our standpoint with the culture I mean, guys have bought into that and it hasn't really been an issue but if you know if if our our context was our expectations the guys are going to come in and we're going to do three lifts a week well then maybe we're fighting an, up, an uphill battle the whole time mm-hmm. so so with regards to the the injury reduction record would you attribute that to all that to your kind of model that you've using throughout the week um yeah i mean i i think you know we did we we you know, we've seen over the last two years you know like a 60 percent reduction in some of our soft tissue injury rates um but but i think they're attributable to to probably three main things and i think that um with our with our high performance model and obviously we're, we're investing a lot of money in what we're doing and uh and and there was a little bit of a thought i think at the club level like okay well we do a really good job so we can bring in almost anyone and, and we can keep them healthy and the reality is um in mls where we're located the nature of the league the nature of games on artificial surface the fact that we travel we can travel upwards of seventy thousand kilometers in a year uh it's a hard league to play in um and so we found that we are taking some gambles on guys that weren't really uh worth the risk you know so so one i think we we put together a profile of what type of athlete can be successful in our environment and we pass that on to kind of management of okay these athletes fit within our with our within our profile and we might always have one or two guys outside of that profile that you try to keep healthy and kind of keep keep on the rails over the season but but some other guys we might have taken chances on before were not anymore and uh and so as part of our reduction injuries is just we recruit better we recruit smarter um the second one is as i said before is that we have bought everyone into this one real day of of a significant strength training session per week um no matter what um and then I think also, you know, the third part is kind of refining some of our our fatigue management, our fatigue, you know, kind of quantification methods, uh, and especially with the communication with the coaches, where the coaches are really on board. If we pull a guy back on a Tuesday or Wednesday during the week, um, and and kind of what that what that means and how we negotiate that, you know, getting the coach you know comfortable with doing the work he wants to do, but then being able to pull a guide back so you know we recognize he's fatigued we're not going to overextend him there Mm -hmm. now that fits perfectly into a little link into your uh, fatigue management protocols do you want to give us a little bit of a insight into the kind of things you're talking about there um yeah i mean so you know post game period you know we've we've been using some hrv technology and omega wave for about the last uh six years actually um so we've got a really a lot a lot a lot of data on uh, some of our guys we've had that whole time um you know so post game my philosophy i think is that when you look at the 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 post game period that that match day plus one match day plus two that's really kind of that the peak of fatigue in the post game period And, and i know there's, you know, some of the research that looks at, you know, okay, how much HRV data do you need on athletes to really make good determinations? Um, but I find if we have a guy five, six years and we have HRV data on a guy for five, six years, that how guys respond within that 48-hour period after a game is really reflective of kind of their state of readiness to train um, and, and, and how their state of readiness to train. But also I look at some of the hrv type stuff as their their recovery ability um if a guy is poor hrv he's still in a very kind of sympathetically dominant um state he's still kind of stuck we call it stuck in like a fight or flight he he's not going to recover as fast um 
you know, he's not going to replete glycogen stores as fast. Uh, you know, protein resynthesis might be slowed. Who knows what's going on? You know, cortisol to a, to a testosterone balance. And so we can see this within the first two days. And we, we know that basically a guy's not recovering at his optimal rate. Um, and so we don't necessarily want to load that guy. Um, however, uh, there are some things that, that he can do. Um, and so, so we basically are using um, HRV and Omega Wave as well as, uh, you know, subjective RPE in the first two to three days after. Uh, and, you know, and again, going through this kind of process of trying to, you know, create this injury risk profile. And it's taken maybe two years to, to really improve the messaging across the coaches. It's, uh, it's been able to let us, um, I think really, really find that right dose. I think in that first three days in the post, you know, the post game period, um, you know, and we've seen great results with that. So, mm. so you mentioned that the if the HRV is down, um, they can still do certain things. What certain things are you talking about there? Um, so, I mean, we're probably going to avoid a lot of higher velocity work. We're going to avoid maybe, you know, extended um, high heart rates. Um, and, and then it goes into, okay, what what activities then can they do? And so, again, with our with our coaching staff and, and the way that we, we kind of run things, um, I mean, typically within your field sessions, you're going to have your warm-up period, maybe a technical activity, uh, a possession type of activity, and then a, you know, a small-sided, large-sided game activity. Um, so we know that... The warm up, if it's not a high velocity session, which early in the week, it you know the first forty eight hours, it's not going to be a high velocity session. Well, that, that athlete can do that. Um, typically, if you look a look at a lot of you know possession type uh, small sided games in the first part of training and, and the durations of those exercises, uh, you're not going to drive high heart rates, and your and your maximal accelerations and decelerations will probably not be that high. Um, and then if you have a group of guys, you know, what, what, I, what my position allowed me to do with, with our coaching staff is we might look across the board and see three, four, five guys that are flagged um, from looking at their HRV data that, uh, okay, well, you know, we, we might do this possession exercise, but because of this, we'll change it to make it smaller or, you know, limit, limit the uh, spaces, make sure there's less accelerations and decelerations so that these four or five guys can do that, and then they're done. Um, so it's really looking at that, you know, kind of the mechanical load and, and being able to tweak the exercises you do in those first two to three days after a game, um, to take into account the HRV status of, of those athletes. Mm. No, that's cool. Just, I've got written down here, your, uh, your profile. So would you just mind giving, um, I don't know if you can, but, um, an insight into your, the profile that you're giving to the technical coaches with regards to the, the kind of recruitment process? Um, yeah, I mean, I think you know, you're you're looking at uh, age. I mean, you know, there's obviously plenty in research now looking at what's predictive of injuries. You know, and, and a lot of it is past injuries and uh, and, and and age. Um, so so we've looked at uh, you know, and then, and then potentially um, how many games a guy's played in the last two to three years. You know, so with the nature of MLS, where you have a salary cap, you have uh, uh, a certain number of foreign spots that you, you can utilize. We get, obviously, agents that are throwing players from Europe over. You know, and now there's there's more players from Europe that want to come into MLS. Uh, you get a lot of guys that might have an injury history, that have a really good resume, that are 31 or 32, and um, they've played 10 games in the previous two years. That's not necessarily going to be a, a guy that I think is going to uh, uh, fit our profile particularly well. Um, versus someone who's younger, who's 24 or 25, who you can still train and you know and, and get strong and um, uh, has time to adapt to our culture and, and make some very good physical adaptations from our culture. Uh, so I think that's it. You know, come if a guy is has an injury history and he's never played on on an artificial surface and uh he's played limited games in the last two to three years to me that that's something that's going to send up a lot of red flags from you know from our profile mm. no that's interesting so i mean you, you mentioned before about one of the um one of the methods you're using to track the guys uh with gps 
Would you mind just giving yep. us a little bit of an insight into the kind of metrics you're looking at with um, when when you're using your GPS? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we've got there's a couple you know in-house metrics that we're using that are you know relatively proprietary, but um, but the basis of it is that you know you're you're looking at um, you know we're currently using the catapult system along with uh, with the heart rate system together. You know, so obviously trying to capture a mechanical load versus uh you know versus an internal load, um, and we've put together a kind of two metrics and one metric that looks more at a uh, higher velocity metric, and one that that creates a uh, you know kind of a, a change of direction, more of an eccentric anterior uh, loading type metric. Um, put those you know kind of three together look at the balance of heart rate load to this high velocity load to a you know change of direction load um, and and obviously we're kind of mixing some of the the, the data you know, if the kind of the raw data together which which in, in some ways can be dangerous you know and I think um, I think the one of the biggest disconnects again between coaching staffs and and, and now sports science people is that sports science people get very, very immersed in the raw data. And the raw data has a lot of meaning to them. Where the raw data does not have as much meaning to to a coach or manager. So it's it's incumbent upon the sports science person to to create metrics that have meaning. You know, and actually one of the most valuable books I've read in the last couple of years was by uh, um, ben Alomar, um, Sports Analytics. And he kind of talked about this kind of in-house metrics idea that uh, that Basically, sports science guys. One of one of their roles should be to to create to create metrics that have meaning for your organization. Um, you know, and if you look at like, let's say the NFL is a good example, where the NFL has a rating called a, a quarterback rating. You know, and if you're above eighty five, you had an unbelievable game. Well, what does that mean? You know, it's 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 a whole series of different you know completion percentage and yardage and touchdowns and interceptions, and it's kind of woven into this quarterback rating. Um, and, and, and people that are around the NFL for so long, that, that metric has meaning to them. Well, what I want to be able to do is give metrics, you know, to our coaching stuff that has meaning. Um, and, and how that manifests itself is now, if we, we can have sessions then where we want to overload velocity or we want to overload, you know, this eccentric change of direction, um, and, and I think then we can use these metrics as a communication point to, to, to drive our training process a lot better, you know, and, and if I think if you look at a lot of teams that have, you know, kind of the same type of significant injury, I, I think, you know, I think a good example, you know, within, within soccer is this, you know, the small side of game craze where, you know, coaches want to do everything through a five against five or six against six. <laughs> and, uh, from, from, a from, a quad adductor type perspective it's a very that's a very aggressive loading um and then the velocities are typically are not particularly you know, very high so there's not much of a of a load and high velocity so you can very easily kind of over train you know quads and adductors under train any high velocity works so now your hamstrings aren't really being stressed or loaded like they are within the game and uh and and a lot of coaches will do that same type of work day after day after day um, then they're surprised when, you know, they, all their wide guys have hamstring injuries, you know, throughout the course of the season. So, so it's about, you know, creating, creating, uh, you know, the metrics where we can really balance over, over, um, the week, this kind of anterior versus posterior loading with our, with our coaching staff. Mm. So what was the book you mentioned? Sorry. What was the name of it in the author? Uh, Ben Alomar was a uh, sports analytics. Just writing that down. Nice. So, with the, with this creating creating these metrics, how would you how would you go about presenting this this these metrics and this data to coaches? Yeah. yeah. In, in what in what form would you? No, that's present a good question. This? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, with my huge advantage is I you know, I've got uh, a data analytics um, specialist, you know, Ravi, you know, Ramanani here, who's worked for Microsoft, is he he's specializes in data visualization. Um, so we're actually using a software called Tableau 
to create our data visualization. Um, you know, we've got a training report that's fairly extensive. And then again, my role is to determine within our training report what's what's the least amount of information I can show that that creates the messaging of how hard that training was and and and, and uh, wow. how it stressed our athletes. Um, and and this Tableau software, I think, is clean enough that that it creates some really good kind of just bar graph type things and um we can then also look at athletes you know compare them to that same type of day over the course of a uh, over the course of a season um and and again you know I, I think that one of the next steps for the sports science people is kind of what what people are doing with data and how they are going to uh to handle that data so so you know our goal is still to, to be as clear and concise and simple as possible with all of our data and give the coaches a you know three to four page report after our training i think anything more than that is too much mm -hmm. so for like a like a one-man band or you know a team with one or two guys who hasn't got the kind of um yeah. financial backing uh, that you guys maybe have what would you recommend to them guys with regards to presenting the data that they are collecting? Yeah, I mean, I think you really have to look at, one, I think you have to read your coaching staff well. And I mean, you know, our, our coaching staff is, a, is actually, you know, kind of a good study in that we have, uh, you know, some, the assistant coaches are all kind of former ex-pros, um, but our, our head coach was at UCLA for years before and, he was uh, was an accountant right out of college. So to him, right. he loves saying numbers. Mm -hmm. Give him numbers all day, and he just eats them up. The rest of our coaching staff d does not like to see numbers. So I think no matter what, I mean, you can still use, you know, Excel and you know, kind of just your standard um, dashboards. Um, but I think you have to, you really have to spend some time looking at your coaching staff and thinking about not what you want to see, but What's the best way to message your your coaches? And are they numbers people, which which most probably are not? Um, are they more visual people? You know, do you use bar graphs? Do you use you know tables? You know, how do you actually present that? But you know, I think that you know we're lucky that we basically our tools are in such a fact you know, used in a way that we've been able to automate our processes really well. You know, so we're not visually you know I think they're the clean looking type stuff, but but the art isn't in how fancy they look. The art is in how you automate your your data process over time. Um, you know, so there's so many online type courses now that that I think you know the next step for a lot of sports science people is, are going to be using databases and and uh, and and being able to automate data processes um, to create really quick, easy visuals for the coaches to look at you know and, and out there there's a lot of kind of standalone software that's popping up out there that, that allows out that to happen but still at the end of the day you can do any everything within excel with a with a csv file if, if you need to well, that's cool <clears throat> so you when you touched on it right at the start um with regards to your kind of um you programming for strength training uh, in, yep. in football do you just want to give us a bit more detail in kind of what your program may look like and how that's individualized across players coming from a background where they're coming through the collegiate system and they've, you know, they've kind of grown up with it yeah. with regards to maybe a European player who, who hasn't been used to that kind of system? Yeah. Well, especially I think that, you know, our, our league is more the, the Latin American player. I mean, we've got a lot of Central Americans that come through our league and, you know, and then some, some, you know, maybe second division type Argentinian, Brazilian type players as well. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, you know, the, the interesting thing within, within our setup is we, we have a, a smaller gym, which means we cannot get the whole team in there all at one time. So we can actually break up into uh, three groups. You know, so it's kind of happened organically, but I think you know, if if even if we had the the size, we would still benefit from breaking up into three groups. And you know, your three groups are uh, your your Americans or your you know your your professionals that have a very very good work capacity that have been taught well, that can lift heavy, that are really comfortable lifting heavy, that lift heavy, and that might mean you know they're doing heavy hex bar deadlifts for sets of five, you know, in season, we probably would not go below five or sixes uh, in season. Um, 
uh, and then you have your group that might be some older European or or uh, Latin American players that that are always fighting kind of some hip pain, groin pain, you know, a little bit beat up, haven't lifted a lot, um, need their their series of of correctives um, in addition to any of the the heavy strength work. Um, this the, the quote heavy strength work is probably going to be lighter than that first group. Um, and then you have your your third group of, of young guys that you want to progress to be even with that first group, but they need work and technique and uh, you know improving work capacity um, and uh, you know and that. But but there's no reason why you get a like right now. We currently have a Colombian player in who's 20, 21, who uh, you know physically should be on par with our first group within two years. I mean he's. He's willing. He's in, you know very good desire, motivation. Just has to learn the technique, and he'll be uh, just as powerful and strong as our as our first group guys. So, so I think there's this natural division within those three. Um, within that, I think you know, the individualization I think comes a lot in the the smaller exercises, and you know, um, especially with us playing on on artificial grass, just some of the little adductor groin hip type issues the pop-up that have to be managed um uh that that tends to be more individualized and then and then the loading i mean i, I still think i mean if the basis of our the basis of our uh programming is probably a hex bar deadlift uh like a kettlebell step up onto a box uh nordic hamstrings um some sort of a roll out um, anti-extension um, core exercise you know as well as the a weight vest pull up and then some sort of an upper body push I and mean, that's that's kind of the standard um daily type uh strength training session there might be little little tweaks and little changes over that over the course of the year but that's kind of the basis of it and then obviously there'll be an individualization of loading and an individualization and some of the the correctives that got added on to that mm-hmm. so how, how have, long go on, sorry, go on. I was going to say we, we haven't really delved into any of the Olympic lifting, um, uh, any sort of snatches or cleans or anything like that. We've kind of stayed away from just because, uh, for the most part, your your foreign players who have never done it will never. It'll be too long before they actually see the benefits of those exercises, um, uh, and you know, there's a good chance they won't even be in the team anymore if you uh, <laughs> by the time they they perfect any of those techniques. So. Um, no, that's cool. I mean, how how long would you anticipate the group three that you mentioned progressing over to group one? How long would that transition take? Uh, I mean, I, I tend to think after after one season, I think you can really start to load those guys well. I mean, I think that uh, that the you know the young guys are physically very very talented. Um, pick up those exercises really really quickly. Um, so. So yeah, I think that they uh, within a year, I think they will. Cool. So I know you're um, you've got a S and C a strength session going on this afternoon. So I won't keep you much longer. But just want to talk to you about your sports science conference that's going in June. Yep. Do you want to yep. give us a little bit of background on the kind of vision behind it and and what's going to happen this year? Yeah, 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 yeah. So this will be the um, fifth year, I think, of our Sounder Sports Science seminar and the. Uh, in the summer, it's typically the first week of June, and this year will be June 9th through 11th um, in Seattle. Um, and how it really actually started was that um, I actually had a conversation, or two conversations about five years ago, a week apart. And the first conversation was uh, from a strength coach from one of our top universities out, out west, and he calls me and he says, man, you got to talk to our soccer coach. He has no clue. <laughs> I mean, I've got strength sessions there set up. We're trying to improve speed power in the off season, you know, or our guys are getting it on. We're lifting heavy and we're making really good progress. And the coaches pull back and now the coaches want to do everything on the field and they're doing 30 second uh, lateral bounds and touching the, the, you know, the goalpost and crossbars and sit ups and push ups and that's it. And um, he just doesn't get strength power development for soccer players. Right. And then, uh, and then literally three days later, 
to me and says, man, you got to talk to our strength conditioning coach. He just doesn't get it. <laughs> all he wants to do he, is lift our guys super heavy. They're in the gym all the time. The guys are complaining they're sore all the time. The guys are getting too big. Like, he just doesn't get it. <laughs> so, you know, because I'm kind of thinking to myself, like, you know, we need to create something that gets everyone, both sides, the the average soccer coach and, and the strength conditioning slash sports science guy, get them in a room, try to look at a common language, try to have one side see the other. Um, and, uh, you know, and we've had just a, a fantastic, you know, kind of group of guys and presenters. And we've had, you know, Darcy Norman's come by a couple of times. Uh, Charlie Weingroff is, uh, has presented. Um, we had at some point or another about every performance coach or performance manager from IX Amsterdam come and present. Um, and it's been just really, really, um, well received. We started the first year. I think we had 35 people. Now, you know, last year we were at uh, 125 people. Um, wow! So yeah, it's it's grown by leaps and bounds. And you know, we say sports science, but I try to get across the board. Kind of a you know a, a performance manager, uh, a real sports scientist, a real strength conditioning coach um, on on staff, and or you know as one of the presenters. And uh, and it's been great. I mean, so this year we have. Uh, I have Matt Jordan, who's a strength conditioning coach for the Canadian Winter Olympic uh, uh, team. He's in charge of SNC for uh, the Canadian Sports Institute for Winter Sports, um, and he's fantastic. Um, we have actually, I think, Michael Watts, who's the performance manager for Aston Villa. Brendan Farner, who's the uh, head of sports science for um, Richmond Tigers of the AFL. Um, we still working on... Uh, a couple more people that I'm uh, still not quite sure um, if they can commit yet. So then we have you know, Terry Peters from Vitesse Arnhem, who's the uh, head SNC for Vitesse Arnhem, but he's also kind of branched into like a lot of us starting to be in charge of the sports science and the data. And they're currently using HRV and Omega Wave and uh, the Inmotio system, which is you know, kind of even one level above uh, GPS in terms of validity and reliability um, and kind of merging that into what they're doing in the weight room. Um, you know, so, so that group together is all really exciting. I mean, I'm still waiting, like I said, and a couple others that I think are uh, going to be fantastic along with it. So, um, you know, probably, you know, at least three of us from our staff will kind of give some uh, talks as well. So, Nice. Um, I'm really excited about it. Yeah, it sounds great. I've I've spoke to a couple of the um, guys in the UK who've been over and couldn't say uh, enough positive things about it. So it's, it sounds great. Yeah. So yeah. so how how much is it, Dave? It is uh, four hundred dollars um, for the three days. Um, there's an early bird special for three fifty for anyone that signs up before uh, um, April 9th, I believe. Uh, and we're actually changing the location as well. I mean, we actually we've we've we have a new club headquarters, which is uh, uh, right down right by our stadium, and they're actually finishing a uh, banquet banquet room uh, convention room in there, which we will hold the event at. Um, it's a little bit smaller and more intimate, so it's probably only going to hold about eighty people, um, which we you know. Which is interesting. I, mean, I think the first couple of years where you know, there was this constant interaction between the presenters and the uh, and the attendees, which made it even really intimate and special. And it's kind of grown, which is great because we've got you know people from all over. I mean, I think last year we had uh, coaches in from the NFL, NBA, NHL, all the you know kind of top collegiate programs um, in the U.S. Um, but it'll probably have to be a little bit smaller with the size that we have but i don't necessarily mind that because i think it's kind of the the intimacy of the event and yeah definitely i try to have the presenters kind of stay there throughout the whole week um just uh ju just to do as much as we can and i mean you know what it's like at most of the seminars where it's the uh sometimes it's the time away from the from the actual event and conference room is just as valuable as the time in the conference room so. oh completely yeah completely so just to finish off, last two two things. Where can guys get you on um, on social media? What's the best place to to figure out what you're doing and, and see what's yeah, happening? Yeah, so I mean, I'm yeah, I think I'm yeah, I'm at at Dave Tenney on uh, on Twitter, and then we actually have uh, at Sounders uh, S P O S C A S C I. 
sports sci. Um, so we've got our own sports science um, Twitter account as well. Um, I'm obviously on Facebook as well at uh, David Tunney on Facebook. So nice. Um, yeah, and again, it's it's such a great community out there now, and obviously that's how we we connected um, as well. So there's you know, it's funny. There's there's definitely something with social media where there's some people that are very leery of it, but I find that it's it just connects people and connects different ideas from around the world. It's been extremely beneficial for for my career, anyway. No, completely. Yeah, completely. So I'll I'll let you go because I know you're uh, you got a session coming up, but um, I just want to thank you for your time. Uh, I've kept you for. 45 minutes or whatever it is so really appreciate yeah, no that and really appreciate no how open you are um especially with the conference and things like that and 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 coming on here and, and telling us what you're doing down at the sounders so thank you very much thanks a lot thanks a lot i appreciate it and you do a great job and yeah, keep doing what you're doing as well so. thank you very much appreciate that cool and i will uh, i'll speak to you shortly okay okay mate thanks a lot okay take care okay bye bye Thanks for checking out episode 29 of the Pacey Performance Podcast. As I said before, thanks again for all the support, getting up to well over 20,000 downloads now. So just before I go, if you want to keep up to date with everything that's going on the podcast, shoot over to paceyperformance.co.uk. You can listen on iTunes and YouTube. And if you do listen on iTunes, uh, please be generous enough to give me a rating and a review. And I will see you in episode 30.